Three things will happen if you do a three month retreat. First, you'll go crazy. <laughs> Second, you'll die. And third, you'll get enlightenment. So which one did I get? Hello everybody, it's Jason here. Well, today is Wednesday. Very early this morning, I went out for a hike. But when I got to the destination, it was closed. So I had to come back. And I guess that's a good thing because I got a lot of things to do around here, especially post camping. Last weekend, we went camping. So I got to clean things up and put some stuff away. Last week, I was talking to somebody about solo retreats. And it reminded me that I've been wanting to do a video about what I learned on the solo retreat. So back in 2006, uh, I was a monk at the time living at the Providence Zen Center. I guess I was feeling there was a lot of things going on, but definitely a little bit of burnout. Providence Zen Center was very busy. Uh, sometimes people think monks are just lying around sitting. It's not true at a lot of temples. They're quite busy, actually. <laughs> so I wanted to do this solo retreat. In fact, I remember at the time feeling like I had to do this solo retreat. Just had to do it. So there was somebody who was practicing with the Providence Zen Center and also a Zen Center in Maine. And she had a cabin on 200 acres of land in northern Maine. It was a town called Monroe. So I decided to do a 90-day solo retreat by myself at this cabin. Now I set many three-month retreats with people at this time, but never by myself. So I wasn't sure what to do for a retreat schedule. So I asked my teacher to write up a schedule for me. Um, I didn't want to write my own schedule. I didn't want to follow my own idea. So I trusted him and I said, you know what, De Kwangsini, write me up a schedule and I'll follow it. Let me show you the schedule he gave me. I still have this schedule here. It starts with waking up at 4.45 a.m. with 200 bows. That's full prostrations. 5.35 to 6.15, some chanting meditation. 6.15 a.m., the Thousand Eyes and Hands Sutra. This is a very long sutra. I'm going to do a video about chanting sometime, and I can talk about it a little bit more. 6.15 to 7.30 a.m., sitting. Then um, had breakfast at 7.30 a.m. After breakfast, I did a little bit of work period. This included uh, cleaning the cabin, chopping firewood, doing outside work, things like that. Also, I guess, prepping up uh, my lunch. My lunch and dinner were exactly the same. I'll, I'll show you my grocery list that I brought to the solo retreat. 9.30 a.m., 200 bows. 10 a.m., 1,000 eyes chanting. 10.15 to 12 sitting. Then there was lunch. Usually after lunch, I would try to take a nap, but uh, sometimes I would just lie down and rest. At 1.30 p.m., 200 bows. At 2 p.m., 
Thousand Eyes chanting, 2.15 to 4 p.m., so more sitting. At 4 p.m., I had a little bit of a break, and this is when I would take a long hike in the woods. At 5.30 p.m., special chanting. That included the Thousand Eyes chanting and Kwan Seon Bosa chanting. 6 p.m., some evening chanting. 6.30 p.m., 200 bows. 7 p.m., Thousand Eyes chanting. 7.15 to 8.30, city. I would then go to bed and wake up at 11 p.m. 11 p.m., 200 bows. 11.30 p.m., Thousand Eyes chanting. 11.45 to 1 a.m., sitting. After that, I would go to sleep and start the whole schedule all over again. Looking at the schedule, there's a lot of chanting for this retreat. I went to my teacher and asked, I thought there was going to be more sitting. Why so much chanting? And he looked at me and said, the chanting is for the demons. Now, I didn't know what he meant about that until I started the retreat. <laughs> I have a few videos about that. I'll put one down in the link below called Demons and bliss. My teacher didn't give me much advice for this retreat. He only told me two things. First, don't be a hero. That means uh, don't try to be a samurai and cut through everything. If you're sick or in trouble, get some help. The second thing he said is let the schedule be your teacher. Because first of all, I didn't have anybody with me, so there was no one to talk to. I also didn't have any books with me. So I let the schedule be my teacher, and that's something that still helps me today. I often get asked, what did you learn during the solo retreat? So in this video, I'm gonna share with you three things that I learned from being alone in a cabin for 90 days. But before I get into that, I still have a couple of things to do, so I'll catch up with you all in a bit. Okay, we got everything cleaned up and put away. Before I get into the other stuff, I wanted to show you what I brought to my 90-day retreat. Here's the food list. I got my list here. One thing to keep in mind is I had no refrigeration. So everything I brought to the retreat had to be non-perishable items. So here's the food list for the 90 days. I brought three 25-pound bags of organic long-grain brown rice two 25-pound bags of organic green lentils, three six-ounce bags of seaweed, three two-pound bags of corn tea, two nine-pound buckets of organic peanut butter, two liters of organic olive oil, four 20-ounce bottles of organic soy sauce. Breakfast was just brown rice and peanut butter for the 90 days. Lunch and dinner was just brown rice lentil soup, seaweed, and olive oil for the whole 90 days. Now, I thought I was going to get tired of this during the first month of the retreat, but during the middle and especially towards the end, every time I had lunch and dinner, I thought it was the best meal that I ever had. Um, I need to get out of this house because my kids are still here and I need a quiet place to talk. So I'll catch up with you in a bit. Well, it seems like this part of the house is quiet. We'll see how it goes. So the first thing I learned on my solo retreat is that you can never be 
alone. Now, this is very difficult to talk about. I'm going to do my best here. You know, before I went to the solo retreat, I never was in a situation where I lived alone or where I was by myself for an extended period of time. You know, I lived with my parents until I was 20. Then my high school girlfriend and I moved to Seattle. Uh, when we separated, I moved into the Zen Center in Seattle. Soon after that, I was living at the Providence Zen Center. So not much time being alone. So when I entered this retreat, it was very lonely, very sad. At least for the first three weeks or so. After a few weeks, there was a full moon. And I remember finishing midnight practice. I walked out of the cabin, looked up at the sky and saw the moon. And at that moment, the moon and myself was not separate. Now, these are terrible words to explain this experience because this experience is before thinking. But it was a hard hit to my mind that, ah, it's impossible to be alone unless we create the strong sense of self. When we do that, then everything is separate. But if we don't make this strong sense of self, then we can perceive the connection with this whole world, not separate. All of us have had this experience of this connection. It's nothing special. There's nothing really spiritual about it. Some people have this experience is when they're walking in nature. You know, they get out of their environment, their element, their conditioning, they go on a hike, and their energy is just in the moment. So they feel this connection. Some people have this experience when they play music or maybe doing art. It's only our thinking that creates the separation. And this thinking is what makes us feel alone. So that was a very powerful teaching on this retreat. The second thing that I learned from this retreat is that mind makes everything. Now, I've heard this teaching many years before I did this retreat. There's a teaching that comes from the Avantamsaka Sutra that we chant in the morning that says that mind makes everything. Everything comes from mind. So I already understood that. But in this retreat, I really got to experience that. And that's one reason why I appreciate longer retreats. So I showed you the schedule. And that schedule was the same every day. I showed you the food that I was eating. I was eating the same food every day. I was sitting the retreat in the fall, so basically the weather was the same every day. But yet, my mind, my experience was different from day to day, sometimes from sitting period to sitting period. One moment, oh, this retreat is amazing. Maybe after this retreat, I can move here and live in this cabin for the rest of my life. <laughs> and another moment, oh, this retreat is horrible. I cannot wait for this retreat to end. So even though the conditions were the same, my mind was different. 
And I think that's something really important to experience. Often we're looking outside of ourselves, blaming people and things for our experience. Ooh, that person is making me mad. Ooh, the weather today is making me disappointed. <laughs> and this kind of blaming, this kind of mind, only creates suffering for ourselves. And then we express that suffering to the rest of the world. And it just goes around and around and around. I know sometimes when I was sitting longer retreats with people, you can say, oh, that head Dharma teacher, they're uh, making me upset, or that person is distracting me from my meditation to keep moving around. <laughs> when I was on the solo retreat, it was just me. So it was a very powerful experience, like a very clear mirror reflecting my mind exactly as it was. And that was a very powerful teaching. The third thing that I learned from this retreat that is still with me today is to be in society. I'm really not even sure how to talk about this, but <laughs> you know, earlier I mentioned the beginning of the retreat, I felt very alone. And then I was having this experience of this connection with this world, so not feeling alone. And then later I realized that I have a very good situation here, very simple situation, but I had shelter, I had food, I was getting enough sleep, I had practice, and when I thought about this idea, I was like, maybe I'll come back after, after this retreat and live here for the rest of my life. I realized that, why do that? And I think something the retreat helped me with too is that I have a tendency, I think we all do sometimes, is to kind of run away from the things that are difficult. So the retreat wasn't easy. It was a mixture of everything, to be honest. But I realized it was necessary to go back and be of service. It wasn't something that was intellectual, like, oh, I'm going to go back from this retreat and help the world. You know, it wasn't anything like that. It was a more strong, intuitive sense that it was necessary to respond to this world. Some of you attended my 10 Ox Herding Pictures workshop. I have a recording of that. If you are in my Patreon community, I'll put a link down below so you can see that workshop. But basically it's 10 pictures showing the different stages of enlightenment. Now, that's not how I talked about it. <laughs> I talked about it as kind of a 10 experiences we may have in our practice. You know, it begins usually with some kind of um, frustration, you know, dealing with our mind, seeing our mind as it is, and then later having this experience of this connection, of becoming one with everything. But the very last picture shows the person walking back to the marketplace to offer some help. One thing I would like to point out is if I didn't have this schedule for those 90 days, I'm not sure if I would have stayed. I would have probably gone crazy. In fact, I heard the three things will happen if you do a three month retreat. First, you'll go crazy. <laughs> Second, you'll die. And third, you'll get enlightenment. So which one did I get? 
Okay, so those are the three things that I learned from being alone in a cabin for 90 days. I'd be interested in hearing from you. Have you sat a long solo retreat? And if so, what was your experience? You can put it down in the comments below. Also, if you are interested in doing a solo retreat, please feel free to contact me. You can do that by emailing me at jason at jasonquinzen.com. You can also go to my website, jasonquinzen.com, and book a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me. I'd be very happy to talk to you about that. Okay, everyone, I hope you're all doing well, and I will see you very soon.